Okay. Uh, well, hello everybody, and welcome to Delta Q's webinar on battery charging efficiency regulations. Today we're going to review the growing scope of energy efficiency regulations on battery chargers and help you navigate the regulations with minimal disruptions to your customers or supply chain. The total time for this webinar is 30 minutes of presentation time with at least 10 minutes of questions at the end. If you have any questions um, throughout the webinar, please submit it through our webinar chat function. And after the, the webinar, we will also provide a recorded version and some useful resources for everyone after our time today. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Amanda Yeo. I'm one of Delta Q's marketing coordinators, and I will be today's webinar moderator. For some of you, um, you may be familiar with our company, but for those who are not, Delta Q is a leading, technology, uh, leading manufacturer of battery chargers for lead acid and lithium batteries. We provide power management and power conversion supply solutions that improve performance and durability of electric drive vehicles and industrial equipment. There are over 1.2 million electric vehicles and industrial machines that use our, our, our products today. On today's call, we have Lloyd Gong, who is Delta Q's Vice President of Business Development. He is responsible for developing the company's relationship with industrial OEMs and battery manufacturers. Previously, Lloyd led the company's product portfolio to compliance with the California Energy Commission efficiency standards for battery chargers. On the call, we also have Chris Botting. Chris is Delta Key's manager of research and is responsible for running the company's battery lab, which is an accredited California Energy Commission standards testing facility. Previously, Chris was a senior systems engineer at an automotive industry, where he led the integration of battery systems into electric and hybrid vehicles. So to just to outline a couple of things that we're going to be going over today, we're going to discuss the impact of the new regulations from the California Energy Commission, and we're going to discuss how it will prominently affect California, but also mention how it will affect other geographies that are considering we're implementing it. We'll also go over best practices for complying with the regulations, including checking for compliance and the timeline of uh, designing a new chargers into a machine if, that, if you deem that's necessary. We'll also go over best practices for complying with the regulations. And another area we're going to cover is the case study for the Gulf market, um, where this regulation took effect in 2013. We're also going to have Chris go through uh, methods of efficiency testings and insights um, generated from our experience in testing chargers, and also, of course, the immediate benefits of efficiency for everybody that is an OEM, a distributor, or an end user. Uh, without waiting any longer, let's get into our discussion. So the California Energy Commission, who are they and why should you care about their energy efficient practices? The CEC are the California's Energy Policy Planning Agency. Established in 1974, their organization is guided by their responsibility in seven core areas in the energy field, from forecasting energy needs to responding to energy emergencies. Their end goal for regulating these battery charger systems is to reduce the amount of energy being wasted from inefficient charging. The CEC estimates that 2,200 gigawatt hours are saved each year from this program, and that would be enough to power approximately 300 um, and 50,000 homes, which is a pretty, pretty big thing for the most part. Um, it, it saves California from having to build additional uh, power plants in order to pretty much to, to power these extras. So from saving this, it's quite saving quite a bit. But when did their regulation start? So to answer that question, I'm going to hand this over to Chris. Right. So looking at the slide with the timeline, um, you can see that uh, the CEC's battery charger regulations were um, adopted in 2012 and started coming into effect in 2013 with a, um, uh, a phased um, regulation as different parts of the market came into effect. So um, the regulations really started with the US uh, Department of Energy or DOE. However, when their regulatory process was delayed, the CEC um, went ahead and brought their regulations into effect in California. Um, since the adoption of the battery charger energy 
efficiency program in 2012, there have been large changes made in both the golf car industry and the lift truck markets. So um, studies had identified battery chargers for lift trucks and golf cars as having the highest per device energy consumption because they're higher power than most battery chargers. So due to those high consumption rates, um, these two markets were the low-hanging fruit. And so these were these were the first two markets where these changes came into effect. The requirements for the golf cart industry came into effect February 1st, 2013, along with other consumer products. And in the following year, uh, January 1st, 2014, the requirements came into effect for larger battery charge systems, um, higher than two kilowatts. Um, which mainly impacted the lift truck industry, where you have a lot of those high power chargers. So the next date to keep in mind then for the CUC's regulations is January 1, 2017. And this is when all the remaining battery chargers, uh, which is under two kilowatts for non-consumer products, is going to come into effect. So um, as of January 1st, 2017, all battery charger systems, whether they're high or low power, whether they're consumer products or they're um, industrial products, will be regulated. So how does this affect you and your company? I'll hand this over to Lloyd. Okay. Thanks, Chris. So clearly, Delta Q, we, we've been planning for this and, and talking about the uh, CEC uh, efficiency regulations for a number of years now. Uh, as Chris pointed out, uh, it was, you know, we started planning probably in 2011, 2012. Um, the first compliance date for us based on where we sell our products uh, was the golf industry. Um, and that was at the time when essentially all consumer chargers had to comply. So everything that charges an iPhone to a, a computer, anything basically that puts energy back into a battery that was consumer based had to comply. They included golf in that for the reasons that uh, uh, Chris mentioned. So uh, for us now, um, the reason we're doing this, this webinar now um, is because the next big compliance date, as Chris said, is January 2017. So again, from a Delta Q perspective in our business, this is when basically all our other customers, all our other markets um, have to comply. So that was a good time to kind of remind everybody of the um, regulations of what it means. So uh, basically where we're at, is uh, everything, you know, everything that we provide today is, is under two kilowatts and this is all going to have to uh, be done uh, for January 1, 2017. The good news is um, all of Delta Key's products, both in our current portfolio and the ones that are planned, um, do comply and will comply. Uh, so we've got this well sorted so customers using Delta Q uh, won't have a problem. Um, Although there are other manufacturers, to be fair, that also comply, and we'll get to how you can check for that. Um, so basically, you know, California took the lead, as Chris said. Um, they kind of went it alone, used largely DOE's requirements, um, and they've imposed uh, their program. What we've seen uh, since the adoption in California is some other states uh, following. So uh, Oregon has followed. We believe uh, Washington is, is uh, also following suit, uh, Washington State, that is. Um, we've heard that New Jersey and Rhode Island will also um, be moving in this direction. We can't say for sure at this point, but the graphic there represents how many customers um, from just from a market point of view will be impacted. So it's approaching 80 million. It's a big deal. Um, so what's the impact to, to battery chargers? Uh, Chris is going to get into how we, we have to test for this, and it is more of a system efficiency. Uh, but from a charger point of view, playing such a big role in the system efficiency calculation, uh, it's our belief that some of the older technology products, being fair resonant and uh, SCR chargers, these will likely disappear over time. We're seeing that now um, as high frequency products be have become lower cost and uh, more feature rich. Um, so we believe that this, this may actually be one of the things that accelerates um, the older style chargers uh, out of the market. And we've actually seen that in the lift truck market, although we don't have high power chargers today. Um, what we've seen in the lift truck market is the big lift truck charger suppliers are all moving to high frequency uh, based topologies. The last point on this slide is, uh, and I've already made it, 
um, sales of non-compliant chargers are, are prohibited according to California's rules. And that includes uh, not just OEMs, over 90% of Delta Key's business is original equipment manufacturers. Um, there's some additional considerations for OEMs, but just to be clear, this includes distributors, resellers, um, products sold off of websites. It doesn't matter where it's being sold from, all that matters is where it's being sold into. Uh, so the markets I talked about, California, Oregon, Washington, uh, today it matters. So that's the impact and some of the things that we're going to see, we, we believe we're going to see over time, uh, actually pretty quickly because we're approaching 2017. Um, for the next slide, you know, one of the things that we wondered about and, and we've had customers over time ask us about is, you know, CEC is doing this, they're leading the charge on it, but does it have teeth? Are they actually going to um, check? Um, that wasn't clear to us at the beginning. <clears throat> this, this little stu case study here, or this example, is one we came across uh, recently. Uh, it's from a well-known company, iRobot. We cast no dispersions on the brand or say that they didn't get ready, but this is the information we have today. Um, and to boil it down, you can see the, the, the points on the slide here. Uh, apparently, uh, they didn't comply uh, in 2013, that first compliance date we talked about. And at some point, uh, this was discovered that uh, they weren't on the CEC database, the testing hadn't been completed, and the product wasn't labeled correctly. Um, and it's our understanding that um, they came to a settlement with CEC that was based on a calculation on a fall of, across all their products that were sold that weren't compliant. The calculation was made, and long story short, they, they put it at about a million dollars. So uh, that sounds like a big deal to me. Uh, I guess the other key point is for this particular uh, OEM, selling a vacuum product, not selling chargers, the charger is just a part of that system, um, they also had to stop selling in, in the California market, which was also must have been very painful. So anyway, we bring this up as an example. Um, I can't tell you how aggressive the CEC is going to be with it. Um, we think it's pretty simple to comply um, if you use Delta Q today or, or other brands of chargers, there's a pretty strong likelihood it complies today, but it's not a guarantee. We have noticed gaps uh, across the market uh, with different chargers that don't appear to comply. And uh, as of Jan 1 next year, like we keep saying, that's the point where it doesn't matter what the chargers or what the application, everything must comply. So just moving on to the next slide, what do, what do you do about it? What do we recommend? Um, we think this is pretty simple, uh, and we'll show you some resources uh, near the, uh, the end of this presentation on how you can check the CEC database. It is a bit painful finding this link on your own, so I recommend you take, link, uh, take uh, note of it. Um, and we'll, if we have time, we'll, we'll walk you through an example. But it's really a, a simple three-step plan here. It's check the charger for compliance in the CEC database. That's the easy first step. Uh, look for your manufacturer and uh, model uh, that you're using today. If it complies, it'll be on the it'll be on that website. If it's not on the website, it just simply means it doesn't comply. Uh, at that point, uh, we recommend talking to your supplier. Maybe they're in the process of, of testing. Uh, you'll find that out at that point. Um, if there isn't a plan, then um, uh, you may be facing the need to source and design a new charger. We're trying not to sell too hard in this presentation, but I do point out again that all Delta Q products do comply. Um, so. Uh, We've, we've been very organized on this subject and made this sort of a worry-free transition for our direct customers. Um, but, you know, just point out that uh, we do have this today and we can assist you with this. Uh, the other point I'd make for manufacturers, whether it be airwork platforms, floor machines, um, if you comply today, um, it's not a bad idea to market your compliance. There seems to be, and, and one of the other reasons we want to have this webinar, there does seem to be some confusion about what's really going on out there. Um, and uh, that was one of the main purposes of providing this information to you. It is real. Um, it is simple to comply. And if you do, uh, you may have a marketable advantage versus your, your direct competitors. So moving on to uh, basically a business case study. I, I started talking a little bit about the golf market. This is a big market for Delta Q. Uh, we have some significant OEM customers in this space, uh, notably 
Club Car, uh, EasyGo, and Yamaha, and others. Um, one of the things that we worked with, um, and we've worked with both manufacturers, here we're outlining a, a Club Car. This is an example, um, as you face these regulations, if you don't have a direct plan and, and maybe even holding off on the design in resources to make a, a different charger selection for whatever reason you think it might add value. In this example, uh, Club Car holistically looked at their system, uh, knew the CC compliance was coming, and uh, actually ended up with you know improving their end product. They moved away from an older technology, went to a more efficient technology, but picked up a number of other benefits along the way, uh, including having the product sealed, um, smaller, they can go on board or off board with the product. Um, and they've, they've labeled this product or branded it uh, their Eric Charger. So it's just, this is a variant of the IC series, IC650 product. Uh, Eric means uh, efficient, reliable, intelligent, connected. Um, so they're touting the benefits of, of the efficiency side of it um, and not just talking about CEC compliance. So point I'm making is um, transitioning to comply can be an advantage for your organization um, and it could be essentially a good excuse to start really thinking holistically about your system and, and how it can uh, be improved. So that's sort of the, the business side of it, um, the marketing bit. Hopefully I didn't sell too hard. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, this is something that is a little bit old news for Delta Q. Look, we've been at this for a number of years. Um, it has been a little bit difficult at times because the rules are, are kind of interesting. And uh, Chris successfully led us into um, our lab being accredited uh, by the CEC. Um, so we've been through a number of tests. Um, and, and he's an expert in this area. So he's going to go over um, the comparative results of our own testing and give you a sense of why we believe some of the older charger technologies um, likely will not comply. It's certainly not impossible, um, but uh, just from a cost perspective, trying to make a fair as uh, charger efficient enough, it probably results in a, an expensive transformer. That's our opinion. Um, but I'll turn it over to Chris so we can walk you through the ins and outs of the testing and what it all means. Right, so looking at this next slide, I've got um, several slides here on the actual CC test procedure, um, some of the things that we've learned from testing our products and other products, and uh, some of our insights into how you go about testing. So um, I'm going to talk about what is the test and what does it measure and how do you pass. But first, um, let's just look at this from the overall zoomed out point of view. So the first thing to notice is that um, this test does not just test charger efficiency, it tests system efficiency. And system efficiency includes the charger hardware and software and its cabling and the round trip efficiency of the battery. So um, Passing the CEC test criteria involves um, paying attention to all of those details and looking at the flow of energy, um, starting at the AC outlet on the wall, through the AC cable, through the charger hardware, through the charger's output DC cable and any interconnections. Um, the energy flows into the battery charging it and then flows out of the battery again to a load. And what's being looked at is the total system efficiency through that whole process from the wall to the output of the battery. So just looking at the next slide um, in terms of insights which we've seen, so we've um, tested our, our charger which is a high frequency switch mode power supply and we've also looked at various other technologies. Um, so the first thing to notice on the the first line of the chart, charger efficiency there, is that um, a high frequency switch mode charger is going to be more energy efficient than um, some of the older technology, like a 60 hertz line frequency ferro resonant charger or a silicon controlled rectifier SCR charger. So um, a typical efficiency for a switch mode charger here is uh, shown to be about 90%. These are all real test results from our lab, and um, that's going to be about 8% more efficient than a ferro-resonant charger and almost 10% more efficient than an SCR-based charger. Um, something else that we've noticed is that um, both the length and the gauge of the AC and DC cabling actually has a um, significant impact on the 
e efficiency. Um, it's not the biggest factor, but it does have an influence. And um, if you choose the wrong cables, it can influence the total system efficiency by whole uh, percentage points. So cables that are longer or that use a thinner gauge will have reduced energy efficiency. Now, what that also means is that um, OEMs can make choices that can boost the efficiency by, for instance, choosing a higher system voltage. So if you take the same system with the same power consumption, uh, but you increase the system voltage from, say, 36 volts to 48 volts, it'll be more energy efficient because at that higher voltage you have lower currents and therefore you have lower conduction losses. Now, looking at the second line, you can see um, the charge return, and the third line is the battery efficiency, and these are, these are linked. Um, so the software algorithm, the charge algorithm, which determines when to terminate the charging process, this is very critical. Um, if you don't put enough charge into the batteries, you can have uh, reduced capacity and runtime and uh, reduced life, and uh, that can result in warranty claims. But um, if you don't put enough charge into the battery, uh, sorry, but um, if you put too much charge into the battery, there's a diminishing return. You can start wasting energy. So flooded lead acid batteries do require a charge return of at least 110%, which means you're putting in at least 10% more amp hours than you, than you took out of the pack. But uh, if you go beyond this, there are diminishing returns. You start wasting energy as heat and in gas generation, and you can uh, degrade and shorten the life of the battery. Um, now, not all batteries are equal. We're talking mostly about flooded lead acid batteries here because that's what many of our applications use. Um, sealed lead acid batteries such as AGM or gel will typically be more energy efficient and will often uh, need a charge return of more like 105% instead of 110% with flooded batteries. So you're, you're, you're putting in maybe 5% extra amp hours versus 10% extra amp hours. Um, and then finally, uh, if you move to a modern um, lithium ion battery pack system, that's going to be highly efficient. Uh, it'll require virtually no overcharge and will have energy efficiencies at least 10% higher than a typical flooded lead acid battery pack. So as you can see here with these three case studies, and these are real test results, um, you've got a high frequency charger which is has efficient hardware, software, and has a charge return around 110% on a flooded lead acid battery. Then you've got a couple of older technology chargers which are not only less um, energy efficient in terms of the charger hardware, but actually one of these chargers that we tested also had a software um, charge algorithm which was putting too much charge into the battery, which uh, resulted in a fail. So to sum this, this uh, slide up, um, OEMs have a lot of power. There's a lot of knobs that you can turn here to make sure that you have a more energy efficient system. Um, it's not just the charger hardware, it's also the charger software. It's the choice of cabling and system voltage um, and also uh, making sure that you source a high quality and energy efficient battery. So looking at this next slide here, uh, we're going to go into just a bit more detail on how the test is actually run. So what you're seeing here is um, voltage and current versus time. Um, during a real test of um, one of our products. So uh, the CEC test follows a federal test procedure. Uh, testing has to be done in um, a temperature controlled lab with um, equipment for automated cycling. Um, you use a AC source to maintain a controlled 115 volt 60 hertz input power and uh, you have to use highly accurate and calibrated power meters to measure both the AC power into the charger at the power outlet and the DC power into and out of the pack as you charge and discharge it at its terminals. So at the left side of the graph, um, the first five hours there is the battery being discharged at a controlled constant current rate to a fixed cutoff voltage. Um, then there's a one hour rest, there's a 24 hour charge and maintenance time where AC power is connected to the charger and it charges and then once it's done active charging um, it's maintaining the battery and then finally there's a second discharge. Um, now 
there are two criteria that are measured and are compared to the regulatory thresholds during this test. Um, and the threshold scale to the battery size. So first, the 24-hour AC energy consumption is measured. So during that 24 hours where AC power is connected to the charger, you're measuring how much energy the charger takes both to actively charge the battery and then also to maintain the battery after active charging. Um, so that first criteria is a measurement of energy. Now the second criteria is a measurement of power. Uh, specifically the standby power when the charger is done charging. So after active charging, in those last uh, four hours uh, after the charge has completed and the charger has cooled down, you measure uh, the average AC input power of the charger to see um, how much parasitic power does it draw from the wall when it's not actively charging. Now, the battery charger system has to pass both of these criteria, both the 24-hour energy and the maintenance power to be CEC approved. And the threshold for each of those is calculated uh, based on a formula which scales with the battery size. So basically, the larger that your battery is, uh, the more energy efficient your system has to be. Um, I'm going to pass this over to um, Amanda now. Uh, so just to let you know, we just wanted to recognize that there are a couple questions on there um, that you guys have submitted a couple questions. We will get to them at the end. Um, but as we continue, we'll, we'll send a link um, just for the re for Chris's research department and insight into the testing process as well. So those will be provided at the end of the webinar. Um, but we're just going to continue here just for a little bit um, into the Department of Energy with, with Lloyd here. Sure. So uh, at the beginning of the discussion, uh, we alluded to the Department of Energy or DOE. Um, California decided to go their own direction, uh, largely with what what with where they were at um, with the test procedures. They adopted a lot of what I think the DOE had in place at the time and decided to impose it in their own jurisdiction. Uh, the question we get a lot on the business side is, uh, you know, they ask our opinion, customers ask our opinion, is this going to become a federal requirement? You know, we, we can't say for sure. Um, all we can say is uh, that the DOE has been working on this for some time. Um, the, the test procedure and what California has done is, is largely modeled on that work. Um, but the DOE, it's unclear uh, when and or if this will become a, a federal requirement. We think it will be, um, but we'll be saying that a while and they keep, keep sort of delaying. There was a public meeting held on September 15th um, and it didn't resolve all our questions, unfortunately. Um, we see test met, the test methodology is, is largely focused or only focused on 115 volts AC. Um, questions like, well, what about split phase? What about three phase? Um, comes to mind. They also seem to be centering in their language more on consumer products, which begs the question, is this going to, um, like California chose to do, is this going to go, go into industrial markets, um, essentially all the ones that we participate in today as a company. Uh, so we can't say for sure. Um, there still is some fuzziness to what's going to happen here. Um, but again, you know, from a Delta Q perspective and from a council point of view to our customers, um, you know, the, the what we have today is the CEC. And what we think, you know, the DOE could come around and impose the same sort of standards. They might have something that lighter. We're not sure. But what we're actually seeing is more states make their own decision for their own reasons, which is largely based on utility cost savings and um, the ability to defer uh, infrastructure improvements by taking load off their grid by being more efficient. Um, so I think that I'm pretty confident we'll probably see that continue because um, it is about money at the end of the day. Uh, it's not about feeling good about efficiency. It is about money. Um, but we don't know 100%. All we're going to do as a company is continue to follow this, uh, continue to update our customers, and uh, definitely we will comply with whatever uh, unfolds uh, through the DOE. Yeah, um, I'll just I'll just jump in. This is Chris. I'll just add to this. Um, so it, it's uh, it's not totally clear um, how the Department of Energy um, regulations are going to pan out in terms of what their scope is and when it'll be implemented uh, and what that'll mean for California. But 
um, it's clear that at some point there will be a national standard. Um, and right now we already basically have a de facto national standard with California and other major states and provinces um, taking a lead. Um, no one's going to want to design, sell, and stock two separate products with two separate supply chains for the complying states and the non-regulating states. So we already have a de facto national standard. And as you've seen with the iRobot teeth, it has it has real teeth both in terms of um, uh, both in terms of possible financial penalties and fines, and also in terms of uh, civil penalties and you know losing access to key markets. So um, although there's some uncertainty with the DOE, um, it's clear that these energy efficiency standards are in place and, and they matter, and they're only going to become more widespread. Yeah, I think that's fair. I, I... Another point that, um, just from a market and product point of view, that uh, I didn't bring up, or I don't think I brought up, uh, we talked a lot about the this, the publicly accessible CEC database, so you can check for compliance on um, on chargers. Um, the other thing that's actually required is that the product, or I believe the packaging, uh, must also be labeled for compliance uh, for uh, for California. So this this label is it's a it's a BC in a circle and there there are some requirements on font size I believe. Mm -hmm. um, you'll notice on Delta Q products uh, where we have our CSA UL approvals and the variety of other things, chargers becoming a look to look like a bit of a NASCAR because we got all these labels of compliance. Um, but one of them you'll see um, is the the BC for the California compliance. So in the case where somebody follows an AC cord up to your product and they're checking the charger. Um, we're trying to make it as easy as possible so you don't get any of these kind of calls from the field um, asking uh, if, if, if you're compliant. The, the other point or the last point I'll make is um, there, you know, there's onboard charging and there's offboard. Uh, we've had questions about this too. Um, for your purposes, if you're selling the charger, whether it be onboard or offboard, it's probably pretty clear, but uh, that does need to comply in, in both of those cases as well. And, I, and as I stated earlier, um, whether it's a part of OEM equipment or it's sold separately, uh, the charger, it, 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 it has to comply if it's being sold in California. Um, some of the other details are if it's been in stock or it was built before the requirement date was set in, we believe that is allowed. Um, but then you're in a situation where you have to prove when the product was actually made. Um, so, so there is a little bit of leeway there uh, for the compliance date. Um, but yeah, I didn't know anything else. I think yeah. Yeah, that's pretty clear. Okay. So we're just going to summarize um, pretty much our, our webinar here then. Um, so now is a good time to check to see uh, if your chargers are compliant and act if you need to. Uh, check with your charger supplier. California is a large market, but even if you don't sell there, it's not that it's not important. This will eventually happen pretty much everywhere in the States. Um, we showed our club car example, which switching chargers may, may be helpful to you in terms of cost-saving energies or, or just making your, your products a little bit more efficient. Um, so at the end of this webinar, which we have here, we've listed a bunch of resources for you. Um, these are these will these slides will be handed out to you at the end of the webinar as well. But we're just going to go through quickly how the CEC um, database database looks like, so you can check to see if your chargers are compliant. Um, so this is the page that you will see that will pull up uh, when you click on our hyperlink, and it will tell you the different models, the appliance types, the company, and the brand. You can search through any of these. Um, just to find if your chargers are compliant. We currently have our company here, obviously, just for a quick show. Um, so if you click search, you'll see um, quite a few of these, our chargers are listed just because we have gone through this process already. Um, just the final notes in terms of our presentation here then, we're just gonna go back to this. So we just have um, last little bits just to give our, our contacts for Lloyd 
and Chris here uh, if you have any questions for them at the end. But we do recognize there are a couple of questions. Um, the first one that we had, uh, it was in regards to whether or not it would be safe to assume that um, you would be able to sell fair resonant chargers as replacements through our parts department, through our local dealers in infected states. So that was a question that we had from one of our, our, um, yeah. our attendees here. Yeah, so um, Chris here, I can, I can take that question. So the question of service parts. So um, can you sell service parts as replacements through dealers in these states that are not uh, compliant? And um, uh, the answer is yes for a while, but it depends. I would recommend that you look more closely at the California um, regulations, and these may also vary state by state. So as the different states have um, um, adopted uh, California's test procedure and threshold, they haven't necessarily copied all of the details of the law in terms of how you get grandfathered in and that sort of thing. But um, generally speaking, uh, the CEC doesn't want to strand users of pre-existing products so that they, they wouldn't have service parts and the, the uh, you know, products would be potentially junked or people would use you know, it would would not have functional products. They're they're, uh, they're trying to make this as seamless as they can. So, um, generally speaking, you can sell charges that were manufactured before the compliance date, and you can also sell service parts um, through your dealer um, under under certain restrictions and for a certain period of time. But um, it's fairly narrow, and there is also a end date to that. So. Um, I'd recommend that you look at that more closely and that you also look at the state level regulations in the different states. Right, and, and uh, just a comment from Lloyd, I, I want to be clear to you, we're, we're, we know a lot about this, but we're not saying de facto that all fair resident chargers will not comply. We're just sharing our experience and what we've seen, um, particularly in the lift truck market, we've seen big companies like Enersys completely change their product line and a big driver behind that was CEC. So they, they made a massive investment in this. Mm -hmm. And we see other uh, companies doing the same thing um, to the point where um, that particular organization, they, they shut down a facility that was uh, winding transformers, the old school, the 60 hertz transformers. So this is what we see. Um, you can make an efficient fair resonant charger, I think it's possible. Um, I just, it, the cost um, to make it comply it, it just becomes more of a commercial issue of, is it worth it? Um, what we see in our business is more and more people are looking for high frequency anyway, for a whole host of reasons. Um, but anyway, uh, just to be clear, we're not saying that 100%, we're just saying as guidance, that's mm -hmm. what we believe is happening. Um, so we have another question. Um, Let us just go through these. Sorry, we're just reading the, the questions right now, so just to make sure that we can cover these. So the, the, the question is, is there concern on the reliability of the vendor supplied data because it's uh, often produced in-house? Mm -hmm. So in other words, does anyone actually verify the test data? Right, so that is a, a excellent question. So um, the way that the way that you get certified is you, you uh, sign up to be a user of of the database either as a manufacturer or as a third-party test lab that can um, submit test results on behalf of a manufacturer. And there's a web form and you submit your test results and uh, prior to doing that you need to fill in some, um, some paperwork um, you know, saying that you'll follow the test procedure, that you'll be a certified lab. Um, but uh, all the testing is, is being done by the manufacturers or by third-party test labs. It's not being done directly by the CEC. Now, the CEC does reserve the right to check your test results to um, um, demand to see not just the end result numbers, but all the data. And they can also um, demand to come and actually watch one of your tests. Um, the other thing I, I, I should state uh, here is that um, the, uh, the CEC has said that um, they will be doing market uh, surveillance, so they'll be looking for um, 
distributors and manufacturers who are selling products that are not listed and they may also buy products and um, test them. Yeah. I think there was another question. Um, other than, so this is other question reads, other than the example shown, uh, the iRobot example, uh, vacuum, has, has there been any other enforcement records for non-compliant commercial and or industrial chargers? I'm not aware of any off the top of my head. Um, you know, the, the iRobot example was sort of the best example we could see. I, frankly, I, I, I got to say, honestly, I was somewhat surprised mm -hmm. um, to see that. It wasn't what I expected to see. Um, but I'm not aware of any, Chris. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm not aware of any other high, high, high profile cases. I mean, this, this case was made public. I don't think it got picked up by anything other than local media. Um, but um, it's possible that the CEC may have made other settlements and, and just not uh, um, publicized them. But uh, generally speaking, um, the CEC, because they are a public body, uh, all of their um, proceedings and their meeting minutes tend to be on the public record. So I think if they'd had any other major settlements, we would we would know about it. Right. I guess from a pre from previous experience, I, I worked uh, for a company that was in the solar industry and. Um, the CEC back in the early 2000s, they they imposed some standards uh, for photovoltaic inverters, for grid tie inverters, for solar systems. Um, and what actually unfolded there was the biggest drive behind compliance was um, whistleblowers. <laughs> it was yeah. people, people basically saying, "Hey, this isn't fair. They don't comply uh, for whatever reason." Um, so yeah, that's always that's also a possibility that. Um, one of your competitors um, may want to use this as a way to to show they comply, and if they don't believe another manufacturer complies after doing the work, um, that's not Delta Q's practice, but it, there's always a potential for that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so we have a question here from someone who works at Zero Motorcycles and uh, would like to know if the CEC standards um, apply to EVs that are that are highway legal vehicles. Um, the con being that typically these vehicles do not fall into the industrial or commercial restrictions. And, and yes, um, uh, certainly um, uh, uh, cars like um, passenger vehicles are not going to be subject to, to these, uh, uh, to these um, regulations. Um, I believe that um, highway legal motorcycles would fall into that as well, but I'd recommend that you look more carefully at the um, legislation. Uh, certainly, there are there are street legal vehicles like low speed and neighborhood electric vehicles, uh, which will have to comply. But you know, those aren't going to be highway legal vehicles. So, um, where the line is there um, exactly, I, I'd I'd recommend that you look at the regulations more closely. But uh, certainly, uh, my understanding is that uh, CC does not apply to passenger electric vehicles like highway capable passenger electric vehicles. Okay. Um. Now, um, we also had a question here on um, what is the most um, important factor in passing CC, the charger, the charging algorithm, the cabling, or the battery? And um, although we are a charger supplier, so of course charger hardware and software is our thing, um, the surprising fact when you actually look at the data is that um, it's actually the battery which has the most impact. Um, so if you were to look back at the numbers that we'd shown for um, some of our successful tests with our products, um, you've got a charger that's about 90% efficient, and that includes the AC and the DC cabling. And you've got a flooded lead-acid battery that, that has a round-trip energy efficiency of about 80%. And, you know, overall, you've got a system efficiency of about 70% versus a pass-fail line that's around 67% or so. And again, that's not a hard number. It scales with the battery size. But so roughly one-third of the loss is happening in the charger and its cabling, and about two-thirds of the loss is happening in the battery. So... There's a couple things there. Uh, one is it's very important that you have a battery that's efficient, both in terms of the battery technology and then the specific make and model. 
And the other thing is that um, battery efficiency is also affected by the software running on the charger, by the charge algorithm. So it's not the battery, it's not just that the battery in, in isolation on its own can be more or less efficient, but uh, depending on the software running on the charger, it can charge it in a more or less energy efficient manner. And that's, that, that's something that we at Delta Q have quite a lot of time and expertise in, and, and, and this is why we have a large um, battery test lab. So yeah, we see, we see some batteries that by the requirements want to see, if it's a, say a flooded, they want to see 115% yeah. overcharge. Yeah. Versus another manufacturer maybe at 110. So yeah. that makes a difference. Yeah. Well, right? There's definitely variability in the energy efficiency of the different batteries out there, even in the same type and with similar makes. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah, so we've got a question here. Uh, how do you get accredited by the CEC? So I think I touched on this earlier, but um, basically to be um, accredited by the, by the CEC, you either, um, you either sign up uh, to be a CEC accredited test lab, or you go and contact and hire a third party lab which can do that um, accredited testing on your behalf. And on the CEC website, uh, there is a listing of all of the certified labs. Uh, most of them are, um, are um, manufacturers like us who do their own testing, but there are also some third party test labs who, who could do testing on your behalf. And then simply you test the products, you submit the data to the website. Um, there's a uh, delay, typically just um, a few working days at most for the CEC to look at the data and uh, confirm that there aren't any issues and then they upload it to the website. And uh, once the data is in the website, uh, you, you are um, considered to be a certified product. Well, that seems like that, that's pretty much the time that we have for, for today and, and all the questions that you have. Of course, you know, take some time, think about it. If you have any more questions, um, again, contact us. Uh, Lloyd's and Chris' emails are there for you to do this. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed it. And if you guys have any, uh, again, a survey will be sent out just to kind of get your feedback on how we did and if this was useful for you. And thank you again for your time. Thank you. Thank you.